Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, now I want to talk about bureaucrats in the deep state, which we all love. Uh, more bureaucracy, more calculation. I feel like, well, hope I'm not boring you too much. So I think an uh, important thing to start off with is defining the deep state, since, oh well, yeah, what is that? Well, the, since there seems to be a lot of disagreement as far as I can tell, I, you ask uh, different people, different uh, authors on Wikipedia what, what the deep state is. So I'm going to try to kind of get an idea, it's, 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 uh, give you an idea of what I mean by it, but it's still going to be a little hand wavy, not super precise. So I'll start off with what I don't mean, and that includes what you find on Wikipedia. So what they say is this conspiracy theory about a clandestine network of members of the intelligence agencies working in conjunction with high-level financial and industrial entities to exercise power uh, alongside the elected US government that might exist. And I find definitions like this uh, unhelpful. It's like, oh, it, it seems almost like a straw man, like, oh, it doesn't meet all this condition, so it might not exist. I mean, I'm like, did the deep state write this definition? <laughs> um, but uh, so I'm not using in that term, like s things that might exist. It's like, here, we can identify them. So you we'll know, start off with what I do mean. So we, what I mean are bureaucrats that, um, well, one condition, they operate with de facto uh, electoral unaccountability. I mean, so bureaucrats typically aren't elected. They're appointed by elected uh, politicians, but, um, and in a de jure sense, they probably could be held accountable, but uh, for whatever reason, or we'll get to some of those reasons, they're not. Um, and so we'll explain why that is. Um, and looking at some, some say they only include uh, the national security oriented agencies. And I'd say yes, let's include them, but let's not necessarily limit it to them. But um, I think an important point is they operate in secrecy. So when I talk about this accountability process that an ideal state uh, might uh, operate to have that accountability process, I, why the, uh, the secrecy undermines that. Another part of the deep state is that regardless of who's elected, um, you know, either in the Congress or in the White House, the members of the deep state tend to stick around. I mean, this is what I mean by a swamp, right? This, a swamp is stagnant water. It's not, you know, a river it trickles through a swamp. They stick around. Um, so I, I see these as, you know, some of the main features. I apologize that it's not a more, like, precise definition, but this is what I mean by uh, the deep state. So we're talking about bureaucrats in the deep state. So, I, uh, go back again to uh, Mises and bureaucracy, but again, that essential feature of bureaucracy, the, that defining feature, is that it's not calculated on the basis of, or that they're not managed according to profit and loss. They have to find some other way of judging their performance. Uh, like Mises says, their output has no cash value on the market. So, um, they, they can't engage in economic calculation. I found in bureaucracy, uh, Mises talks about the FBI, which I would include as part of this definition of uh, the deep state. Uh, he says, the objectives of public administration cannot be measured in money terms and cannot be checked by accountancy methods. Take a nationwide police system like the FBI. There is no yardstick available that could establish whether the expenses incurred by one of its regional or local branches were not excessive. It's like maybe uh, uh, any amount of money might be excessive. We don't know because uh, consumers aren't able to demonstrate that they prefer whatever outputs are created by the FBI compared to alternative uses of their money because they're paid through uh, taxation. And I think this is really important when we're uh, about to describe uh, some ideal model of how, like, under the, I mean, heroic assumptions, how uh, a, an ideal democratic state might work. And I think you kind of have to assume away the calculation problem, but, oh. Well, I'll get to that uh, right now. So here, well, I have an image of uh, a book by Chris Coyne and Abby Hall, from which I borrow from heavily in this discussion. Uh, it's a pretty fascinating book on uh, US government propaganda. But in one chapter, they present this model of what they call the ideal protective state. I, I believe the protective state is James Buchanan's term, but it's 
basically equivalent to what Mises means by uh, the night watchman state, this uh, very limited state that um, t uh, defends property rights. That's the sole purpose of government, to protect and enforce rights from internal and external threats. So the functions that they operate are the police, the courts, and the national security state, including the military, and uh, probably the intelligence agencies as well. And this model, I imagine if you will, uh, is characterized by the existence of effective mechanisms by which voters hold politicians accountable. They're able to monitor them, uh, reward them if they do right, punish them if they do wrong, and um, yeah, keep good tabs on what they're doing. So um, in the operation of this ideal protective state, uh, elected politicians are assuming that they are publicly spirited. I mean, that's the only people, uh, you know, the people would elect, right, are just uh, publicly uh, interested politicians. So they engage in protective activities only when it's in the interest of citizens. They wouldn't do things like uh, have a military contract, making a bunch of Abrams tanks that they know won't reach the battlefield because they have some special interest that wants to be paid to make Abrams tanks, whether or not they're uh, useful for uh, the electorate. So under this uh, ideal state, uh, elected politicians don't do those things. And elected officials, since bureaucrats are appointed by the elected officials, uh, voters through their elected officials hold the bureaucrats accountable. So uh, the elected officials also monitor and uh, reward or punish bureaucrats, um, making sure they only add uh, value-added inputs in the production of security. But again, this um, ideal operation of uh, this magical ideal state it requires uh, abstracting away from the calculation problem as if uh, it can be known in a bureaucratic framework what national defense inputs are actually value added. And without knowing that, it's, a, it, um, it's kind of a required input for all the uh, waste, fraud, and abuse uh, that people don't know what exactly is value added. Another assumption. There's symmetric information between the citizens and these political actors, both elected officials and bureaucrats. So everybody knows what's, everybody, there's no secrecy. Everybody knows uh, everything that's going on. And so based on these assumptions, there's no room for opportunism, waste, fraud, corruption, or abuses of power, um, partially because political actors are assumed to be ideal civil servants. But I would argue that, that I mean, say that with a straight face, but even if you assume that, uh, there's still the calculation problem. That is, even if we assume the best of intentions uh, among politicians, even if they wanted to only acquire, say, tanks and planes and bombs and guns and all these things that are inputs into defense, uh, they don't know the ideal amount because there's not a market for this. So I would argue that the fact that economic calculation isn't possible for these bureaucracies in uh, acquiring these inputs, that's a necessary ingredient for there to be waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, so even if uh, angelic politicians tried to minimize these things, uh, they wouldn't know how to do it um, perfectly well. I mean, in extreme cases, like, we know these tanks won't ever reach the battlefield. Well, maybe we'll send them to Ukraine or whatever, but uh, they're not, they're not going to be an input into American defense. Um, things like that, I think we can say even absent a market that, yeah, that's probably waste. Or, um, but that's beyond, um, there are cases closer to the margin where maybe, maybe not. Um, but the point is, even with the best of intentions, uh, they won't know. Yeah. So I'm going to show this operation of the ideal state uh, visually. So here you have the voters, the citizens, they monitor and uh, reward or punish elected officials. And through their elected officials, uh, elected officials acting on behalf of the principals, the voters, punish or reward bureaucrats. And also add, because of that symmetric information assumption, that, uh, that what do they call it, the, uh, the fourth estate, you know, they, keep the C-SPANs informing everybody of uh, what elected officials and bureaucrats are doing. And so they inform the voters. So the voters are 
fully informed of the relevant information to hold uh, politicians accountable. So that's the ideal state. Here's the actual state. There's a lot of problems. So one of these principal agent problems, the agents being the politicians, um, there's, you know, their interests aren't fully aligned with the voters. And so uh, they might diverge. They're not necessarily doing only those things which uh, benefit the electorate generally. There's also issues with the effectiveness of voting, um, which I'll get into. You also don't have fully informed voters. Uh, they are I mean, what public choicers call rationally ignorant. Of course, they use uh, rational, not quite in a Misesian sense. Um, in a Misesian sense, there's no irrational uh, ignorance. Um, what they mean, in, well, I'll explain what they mean in the next slide. Uh, you also have vote-seeking politicians, and that might not be so bad, but uh, if it were the case that gar uh, garnering the most votes was aligned with what's in the interests of citizens. But it's often not. One of the reasons is special interests. And again, uh, just to reiterate this point, since I see it as crucial, the lack of economic calculation makes it impossible to determine whether bureaucratic inputs are value-added or whether they're waste. Okay. Let's talk about the, a little bit more about the limits of the voting booth. So citizens often lack the incentive to become uh, fully informed to monitor, reward, and punish elected officials. Um, I mean, you think about uh, the cost of acquiring information. So I've been in the market for a, an automobile for a while, um, and I've spent a lot of hours researching because I have the ability to decide whether to buy this car or not buy. Like, I get to make the ultimate decision. Whereas, when we're thinking about voting, it's like, uh, you have a very, very, I mean, uh, astronomically small, or is that correct? <laughs> Microscopically small chance of affecting a, a, the outcome in an election. Uh, so most people realizing this, it's like, why become informed about these things I can't really do anything about, right? or why vote at all? It just um, doesn't make sense unless this is just a consumer good for you, like, oh, I like this is politics, but it, uh, it doesn't make sense to become informed about politics in order to like, make the right voting decisions. Um, especially not uh, in national elections. So since voters aren't fully informed, political actors, such as those in the deep state, have the incentive to use propaganda to influence what information is available to voters and how it is framed. And I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. There's also this issue of there being substantial time between elections. Like for most consumer, even if I bought a car, found out it was a bad decision, like I can, I might take a little bit of a hit, but I can go trade that out um, pretty quickly. Uh, I can fix uh, bad decisions I've made. Uh, with uh, federal elections, so think of uh, presidential elections every four years. Um, I wonder how many people voting for George W. Bush in 2000 uh, could anticipate what became of that, um, especially after 9-11 where you have a big expansion of the deep state. Uh, the creation of the Department of Homeland Security, and so forth. So if they said, whoa, I uh, made a mistake here, they have to wait till the 2004 election to, uh, well, vote for someone else, possibly. Um, but even if they wanted to, these, once you create these bureaucracies, they're very hard to uh, get rid of. They've become established. Uh, people in 2001 seeing what was going on, like listening to Ron Paul or Lou Rock would be like, uh, well, we can't say anything about it until 2004. So this time between elections um, really limits this uh, as a mechanism of voting, or mechanism of voting uh, in terms of holding elected officials accountable. Then I want to talk a little bit about special interests. So, for example, the military-industrial congressional complex. I know, can't remember all the hyphenated terms that Dr. Kiyokowski mentioned. Um, We'll just stick with these. Uh, so with their referring to, well, just as I suggest, the military, uh, private industry, and Congress. And why are special interests effective? Because if we think in terms of the idealized state, I mean, wouldn't politicians want to pursue policies that benefit people generally rather than well, specific interests? 
because, I mean, the more people you, you uh, benefit, that should result in more votes, right? Well, not necessarily. So an, another, to well, bring in a uh, catchphrase that the public choice economists seem to like, which I think is useful, is this idea of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs. So if you think about uh, something like a tariff, right? Tariffs, uh, there's way more consumers of, say, say you have a sugar tariff. There's way more consumers of sugar than there are producers. Um, but the costs of this tariff are spread among lots of consumers, whereas the beneficiaries are just you know, uh, sugar growers. So for them individually, uh, it might mean you know, the difference of tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, the tariff policy. Uh, so they have an incentive to lobby regarding it. Whereas most sugar consumers, this might mean a few dollars difference every year, so you're not going to go uh, become a lobbyist over it um, as an individual taxpayer. So in this way, special interests can make a much more effective lobbying group than uh, you know, bigger groups that are for whom it's more costly to organize and for whom individual benefits are small. And so, um, as special interests, I mean, they can have this uh, interest in shaping public policy, um, such as by uh, inflating national security threats uh, compared to what they actually are. They have an interest in people being misinformed, that if they think, like, oh, I'm unsafe, let's make sure uh, you know, NSA and CIA and all these agencies are well funded. Um, yeah, they, they don't have an interest in necessarily that... Uh, voters have a of symmetric or correct information as uh, the bureaucrats do. Okay, so to go back to our uh, depiction of this process, let's add an element. There we have the deep state. So um, not necessarily, not identical with bureaucrats, but a subset of the bureaucrats. And I want to talk about how they affect the pieces of this supposed uh, uh, accountability process of the uh, operation of the ideal state. So first, just going around the horn, just going, not n necessarily any order except uh, clockwise here. So starting with the media. The deep state does things like disseminate disinformation or insert their own personnel in the media and engage in censorship. So examples of that. Uh, Dr. Peter Klein mentioned this uh, particular story in which, uh, fifth, so it says, Hunter Biden's story is Russian disinfo. Well, the disinformation here is that it's disinformation. Uh, so, and, and I want, at a terminological point here, there's a distinction between misinformation and disinformation. They're both false, but disinformation is, uh, the person spreading it is intending to spread false information, where misinformation, they, uh, the disseminator might believe it's true. So in this case, as you're probably aware, this um, news came out soon before the uh, 2020 presidential election. Um, on Hunter Biden's laptop was, well, various things, including, uh, well, evidence that he might have been peddling inf the influence of his father with um, foreign actors. And so uh, little 50-some CIA, other spooks, they signed this letter saying, this has all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. And, well, in addition to uh, well, spreading that, they also censored, uh, or got Twitter to censor uh, this story from being spread. And uh, polls, uh, to the extent you trust them, suggest that a lot of people might have voted differently had they been aware of this. So the reason they do this, this particular case, I'd say is probably to influence the outcome of the presidential election. Uh, also, I think this is interesting, worth noting, the author, whose name you probably can't read, uh, Natasha Bertrand, um, she's an interesting figure. She seems to just fail upward, where, I mean, she, she's like a, a reliable, I mean, they go to her. The deep state knows, like, yeah, she'll publish whatever we send to her. Um, maybe, like, she was publishing the Steele dossier or anything, not really doing any uh, investigative journalism to see whether this is true. So in that, in that sense, I don't, when I'm talking about the deep state affecting all, it's not the case that there's an adversarial relationship. It's like Natasha Bertrand is like, oh, great for her career to be like, oh, I got this inside scoop, even if it's 
well, fake. I mean, it doesn't seem to hurt her as far as I can tell that she's publishing this uh, fake information regularly. Uh, and that was something else uh, Dr. Kayakowski mentioned, that uh, agents within the intelligence community will send out this, I mean, maybe underanalyzed intelligence that ends up being false. Um, so yeah, be skeptical. If you ever see, read in the media, like, oh, this is what this anonymous intelligence official said. Like, well, th they might have a, a different reason for spreading that other than um, keeping the citizenry well informed. They also insert personnel. It's kind of funny to think a few decades ago, uh, Senator Frank Church of Idaho had this uh, investigation, finally, Operation Mockingbird, it was called, where uh, intelligence agencies were trying to you know, shape what the media reported. Now they don't really need to. They just uh, get hired by them. So this picture um, is, I think, Matt Taibbi I, I took this from. So you see these 16 people. They all work for MSNBC. Uh, they're from some of our CIA, FBI, DEA, Department of Justice, U.S. Army. Uh, and it's not just like this at MSNBC, but other uh, you know, legacy media outlets, cable TV. Uh, they really can shape the discussion that takes place. You don't really hear, like, if you think you change channels and you're like, oh, I'm hearing the same thing over and over. Th this might be part of the reason. Like, they don't, uh, they have a pretty unified message. And they don't, they're not really critical of U.S. foreign policy. They're not going to really criticize uh, the U.S. role in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine or things like that. Um, this helps shape uh, public opinion. And it's, you know, not, I mean, only a recent thing. Even even the New York Times talking about this. Uh, this those other guys. Maybe uh, they were more willing to be critical of uh, George W. Bush's foreign policy, even though it's not quite different uh, than what it is today. But they had this story about uh, the Pentagon sending all these retired officers to shape terrorism coverage from inside the TV and radio networks. And it's not only at uh, the legacy media outlets for people who still watch cable news. Uh, it's also on social media. So you have uh, CIA agents getting into Facebook, um, being in charge of their content policy. I mean, Google as well, having you know, over 100 spooks on their payroll. Um, and as yeah, I don't have to uh, continue mentioning like the, the, the censorship that takes place. We mentioned the Twitter files, um, recent cases of FBI, uh, current case of them uh, getting in trouble, talking to social media companies, trying to uh, tell them what topics to not talk about. So that's all these ways in which uh, they shape how the media reports things. Now, going to voters or just the citizenry in general, there's a few different activities that the deep state uh, undertakes. It's one of those. They might investigate and intimidate dissidents. So, I mean, recent examples include like, uh, no, no, not sure if it was just limited to one FBI field office, but like, oh, we gotta investigate those uh, radical, those rad trad Catholics, or uh, you know, uh, pro-life activists, or uh, parents who go to school board meetings and are upset. Uh, like, I think that was I mean, again. This you know serves a certain constituency. The uh, I believe it was the teachers' unions that asked the, the DOJ, like, look into these teachers that are upset at us. And so, um, yeah, there's these symbiotic relationships here. If, um, they can, if the deep state can have certain um, constituencies on their side and intimidate uh, those critical of uh, the regime. They also manufacture plots or, I, I think, essentially engage in entrapment. They've been doing this for a long time as well. Um, in years past, it was you know, going and finding young Muslim men on the internet, uh, radicalizing them, uh, giving them weapons and plots and money, and then foiling those plots. And look, uh, the, the FBI stopped this terrorist attack that they created. And I mean, I think there's various reasons for this. Um, part of it's to like justify, like, look at th th these terrorist plots. We need our spying powers. We need uh, increased budgets, justifying what they're doing. And I mean, more recently, I mean, the domestic terrorists have changed, but it's still kind of the same plot. We uh, insert our uh, informants, we create plots, and uh, then stop those plots. And so, yeah, I think it's to maintain uh, their power, their, um, you know, their uh, 
Foreign Intelligence uh, Surveillance Act warrants, um, they can point to these. Like the DOJ is, look at all this domestic terrorism. I look into the individual reports because um, don't trust their numbers about what they're doing. Now, talk about uh, the deep state and elected officials. Um, again, sometimes this is ad, it depends just, and I should back up and say, I don't mean to portray the deep state as this unified entity, just like elected officials aren't this one unified entity. There are factions, and um, so they, it shouldn't be treated as a monolith. Um, so the deep state will you know, uh, benefit some uh, elected officials, harm some other ones. Uh, one of those ways, which I call uh, Six Ways from Sunday. And this is a, a reference to uh, Senator Chuck Schumer had this interview with uh, Rachel Maddow in which they were discussing Donald Trump uh, claimed to be this victim of the intelligence agencies going after him. And Chuck Schumer says, well, let me tell you, you take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday of getting back at you. And I'm not sure all the six ways uh, from Sunday they have, but uh, what this might include, maybe opening a false investigation against you or uh, leaking disinformation to the media about things you've done. Uh, or malicious or selective prosecution, maybe prosecute you for these things that all other politicians do and don't seem to get in trouble for. Uh, and this is nothing new as well. I mean, you think of uh, the start of the FBI with J. Edgar Hoover. I mean, he had his dossiers on politicians. He had leverage over them. Um, so this is nothing new. So I think this can help uh, if elected officials have the ultimate power to I mean, hold uh, bureaucrats accountable, having leverage over them might undermine that part of the uh, accountability process. I mean, another important point is that bureaucrats, so the fact that unlike for-profit management in which, say, the uh, upper manager can look at managers of individual divisions, as Mises says, and look at their profit and loss statements, they, ultimately that's, you know, really economizes on the information the manager has to know. It's like, oh, you're making profit? Good for you. Um, doesn't have to know much more than that. But with bureaucracies, they don't have an ultimate number like this. They, I mean, whew, I'm wondering how the FBI would show uh, the uh, elected officials, Congress, like, oh, here's all the things we're doing and you should keep funding us. Uh, we're definitely not going to tell you about other things that we don't want you to know about. So they, the elected officials depend on bureaucrats to keep them informed. <coughs> And this can be a problem. So uh, when they can lie with impunity or hide information, like for example, within that uh, coin and hall book that I'd mentioned, uh, I have a story about this Pentagon report where they found out, I like, just calculated all this waste that the Pentagon uh, was engaged in. And then they hid that report. And it wasn't published. They didn't tell Congress. So they, like, they have this discretion. or They're not supposed to, but if they can keep it a secret, uh, what can Congress do about it? I think also lie. So an example of that, here's a uh, former director of Na national intelligence, James Clapper. So he uh, lied under oath in 2013. He was, um, well, with impunity. I mean, this is supposed to be you know, a felony to lie under an oath and lie to Congress. Uh, he was asked about the mass surveillance program on, uh, of domestic spying. Said, no, we're not doing that, which ended up, of course, being false. Um, not much happened to him. Well, by the way, he's employed by CNN now. So uh, <laughs> I guess maybe that was good for his resume. But, oh, and this, I have a, I find this uh, find of a funny side note. So it, I mentioned the, uh, p the author of that Politico article, uh, Natasha Bertrand, where um, she published that letter signed by all those intelligence officials that the Hunter Biden laptop was Russian disinfo. She works for CNN now too. So uh, James Clapper and her, they're uh, co-workers. But he had a beef with her, because he's like, hey, uh, she misrepresented what I said. Like, we didn't say this was Russian disinfo. We just said it had all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I mean, it, it accomplished its task, really, I think. Um, I guess I'm not sure if that's failing upwards. But I mean, she's not out of a job. She's at CNN now instead of Politico. And, yeah, it's interesting, but like, I have to think more. Like, I have to update how I see these media outlets in terms of what, what do consumers want? Do consumers want consumers of 
uh, news media. Like, I would think naively that they just want accurate information, but maybe they just want to confirm their biases. I don't know. Like, it's weird to me that um, these, uh, no, I, I mean, I guess people don't watch CNN anymore, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to understand that, but I guess it's also a mystery with Tucker, right? Uh, if you have the most viewed primetime cable news guy, why do you get rid of this? I don't, don't they want to make money? Uh, you know, it's a question. I don't, I don't have the answer. Uh, another example. So uh, earlier this month, FBI Director Christopher Wray was brought to testify before the House Judiciary Committee, among a lot of things, um, including this case of, well, it's kind of been bouncing back and forth, where the FBI is in contact with social media companies, trying to shape what things they uh, don't allow on their platforms, uh, among other things. And it's interesting if you watch the testimony he gives, where it seems like he like, is either really evasive answering questions or just feigns ignorance. So like when he's asked questions like, you know, how many FBI informants or undercover agents were on the Capitol grounds on January 6th? And it's like, he doesn't know. And I'd be like, how do you not know by this point? There's no way you don't know. Uh, but it doesn't seem like he'll face any consequences because of this. Um, so like, it seems like either sheer incompetency or he's probably more likely lying, but doesn't face any consequences. So it's not clear how this uh, accountability process can uh, operate if bureaucrats are supposed to keep elected officials informed, and when they don't, well, nothing happens. I think another interesting thing, if you watch uh, some of the other questioning, so, I mean, from some of the congressional Republicans, you know, it's fun watching, like, Matt Gates, for example, like, questioning Christopher Wray. Uh, it gets real heated, and it's, it's entertaining. Uh, it's also interesting to watch other questions. So this is uh, Representative Hank Johnson from uh, Georgia, and he had this question. He asked, Director Ray, are you aware that MAGA Republicans have repeatedly called for the FBI to be defunded? Can you briefly describe for us what the effect would be on our national security or domestic tranquility if the FBI were defunded or dismantled? <laughs> and so, like, yeah, just throwing him the softball, like, tell us how great your agency is. Uh, and I find that interesting in that, I mean, you'd think they'd at least want to, like, maintain the... Uh, I mean, the facade of this adversary, not necessarily adversarial, but we're here to hold you accountable. I mean, I think of the, if you're familiar with uh, the professional wrestling terminology, uh, kayfabe, um, where, like, if you know, Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant, you know, they're supposed to hate each other in the ring. If they're seen out in public, they're not supposed to be seen out in public together, like, being buddies. You know, they have to maintain the kayfabe, uh, make it seem like they are actual enemies. And, like, I don't know, maybe that's what the Republicans are doing. Like, they get really heated and uh, th they're questioning, but then nothing happens. To so, yeah, I, you got to, yeah, I'm trying to understand that. What, what kind of image, because this does, it seems detrimental. It's like, oh, I, you guys seem too buddy-buddy. But then maybe the other ones are just uh, fake fighting. Uh, no. And lastly, talking about... Uh, deep state within, well, the bureaucrats within the deep state, within the bureaucracy generally, um, there's supposed to be an accountability process. That is, like the Department of Justice uh, does these prosecutions um, sometimes, or they may fail to prosecute misconduct. It seems like there's a lot of that lately, it is to me. Uh, for example, this is uh, Special Counsel John Durham, and uh, so he was appointed as special counsel to investigate the FBI's uh, crossfire hurricane operation. That is, uh, the crossfire hurricane was this investigation into the Donald Trump campaign um, regarding uh, Russia collusion, these kinds of things. And I mean, if you watch the testimony he gives about that, I mean, he says all these things like, the FBI didn't have an adequate basis to launch crossfire hurricane. Uh, they failed to examine all ex available exculpatory evidence, as evidence showing that uh, this, what you're investigating isn't happening. Uh, they continued uh, the investigation even when case agents were unable to verify evidence, such as that uh, provided in the Steele dossier that was paid for by the Clinton campaign. Uh, they did not interview key witnesses, and individuals abused their authority under the FISA Act. They uh, got all these warrants that uh, they 
did not have uh, real sufficient evidence to acquire. And it's like, w w did anybody get in trouble for this? I, it's not clear. It seems like, yeah, he just, I mean, he did his investigation, like, yeah, a lot of bad things happen. That's too bad. Uh, I, I kind of feel like Chris Farley, in <laughs> talking to J Bill Barr, this is a, a, the uh, attorney general, is like, why isn't anybody getting uh, in trouble? Uh, um, so, yeah, it's a strange thing. Um, yeah, this failure to prosecute. So, like, if you are doing these operations, try, like, what's the incentive not to do that anymore? Like, if it's consequentless. Okay. And additionally, say this failure to prosecute also includes, includes elected officials or the family members of elected officials. Um, so, again, it's not necessarily adversarial between the deep state and these other elements. It may be uh, symbiotic. Okay. So, yeah, we're cruising. So some concluding thoughts. Now, obviously, I've probably failed to keep this a mostly positive rather than normative analysis. But, so let's say you think this isn't great. Say you think this is a bad thing. Uh, what might be done from a Misesian perspective? So would that be uh, oh, defund the FBI or defund the deep state as uh, Representative Hank Johnson suggested? Yeah, I think Mises is into this idea. Uh, to quote Mises, as I like to do, he says this in uh, Bureaucracy. He says, the two pillars of democratic government are the primacy of the law and the budget. The administration in a democratic community is not only bound by law, but also by the budget. Democratic control is budgetary control. The people's representatives have the keys of the treasury. Not a penny must be spent without the consent of parliament. So what he's saying there is like, okay, if these you bring in these uh, deep state guys, question them before Congress, and they're evasive, they lie to you, uh, nothing else, you can cut their budget. That's always within the power of Congress, of, of the elected officials. So that's one po possible response. I think also, like more generally, uh, reduce the role of the state uh, throughout uh, bureaucracy. Mises says, oh, people complain about bureaucracy. It's this pejorative term. People hate dealing with it. If, I mean, people think of the, you know, the DMV as depicted earlier or any other time you interact with the government. People think it's unpleasant and they think that's bureaucracy. And what Mises says is, well, anything you're having the state do, it's going to be run bureaucratically. It can't be run according to profit and loss and consumer preferences and these kinds of things. So, it's like your problem isn't necessarily with bureaucracy as such. It's with the state doing these things, because I mean, if the state's doing these things, it's going to do them bureaucratically. So it's not the case that you can have this expansive role for the state and not have the bureaucracy. Like They're intertwined. So if you want to uh, ameliorate this problem of uh, bureaucrats in the deep state, like. Make the state smaller, shrink the bureaucracy, have the state responsible for fewer things. Um, so that's uh, all I have. Thank you for your attention.